you. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question and put you on the spot. Yes, indeed. In the event mm -hmm. that he would agree to sit at this end of the table, mm -hmm. would you agree to sit at that <laughs> end of the table and then a discussion take place? Should I do that? Oh, God. It's evident that he cares. What do you care about? Welcome to The Rock Newman Show. It's The Rock Newman Show. Greetings and thank you again for tuning in to the Rock Newman Show 2.0. This show is being brought to you from the studio of We Act Radio in Southeast Washington, D.C. at 1918 Martin Luther King Avenue. Uh, it's something that I like about broadcasting this show from, from here. Years ago, when this show was first getting started, is when, when, when the Rock Newman show was just getting started, um, I started the show here at We Act Radio. And at that time, I coined the phrase, the little station that could. This was the little engine that could. Uh, people predicted the station's demise within months. It is still here, stronger than ever. Um, a, a little bit ago, this station was alluded to and talked about in the New York Times as being the station that had the impetus for the story that the New York Times read that, talked, uh, that asked the question, can Anacostia, Southeast, build a bridge without, Displacing. without displacing the people? And um, this station right here, right here in Little Southeast, the little engine that could, ended up finding itself in the New York Times. And more importantly than that, you know how some folks get, my mama used to say, oh, they think they such a much. They so such a much. But after the New York Times, they didn't rest on their laurels. They've been working and they've been in this community relentlessly trying to make this community a better place to live. So my hat goes off to We Act Radio and this particular studio here. I am beyond excited to have our uh, guest right now. It's Tariq Nasheed. Many of you know him from the incredible documentaries that he's done, and uh, including Hidden Colors. You know him from the work that he has done on Haiti, which is something that we will want to talk about here today. But without any further ado, Tariq Nasheed, thank you. My brother. Appreciate you coming to see The Rock thank on you. the Show. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. Thank you. You know, 
I was, uh, I woke up recently and I had a feed, something came in on my phone that talked about the runaway violence mm -hmm. in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Tariq has been on our show before and we talked, uh, but we did a two part special on Haiti. And uh, Tariq uh, participated because of his information and knowledge of the situation and about the revolution uh, that, that, that took place in Haiti and how Haiti has really been the doormat to the extent of colonizers throughout. And Haiti, I have a soft spot for Haiti because of the, uh, the abuse that it has taken. And it, it took, Haiti is a glaring example. It is a microcosm of colonialism and what some folks call white supremacy. I don't call, I try not to use the word white supremacy anymore. It's flat out racism. It ain't nothing supreme about it except for its diabolical behavior. So I would like to ask, uh, uh, Tariq, as we start here, give us some feedback on Haiti today. Well, when I did the movie about Haiti, I was inspired about that history. That was the first time in history where a slave population rose up against an oppressive system and dominated that system and, and beat them and ran them out of there. Not only did they dominate France, they dominated all the other European superpowers, which were Spain and Britain at the time. That story has been deliberately suppressed because they know that history and the victories and the losses will inspire the next generation. They don't want us to know about black people who stood up for themselves and freed themselves. They always tell the story of us being free at the benevolent of some white person. There has to be a white savior somewhere. The story of Haiti, there is no white savior. And I was inspired by that. Not only did they free themselves, what people don't know, the brothers and sisters in Haiti, they helped free colonialism in other South American countries. A, a lot of countries were going to Haiti for help. So Haiti has been thrown under the bus by a lot of these other countries and the European powers. So I wanted to tell that story. Right now, we have a movie coming out in a couple of months called American Maroon, because there was also a revolution going on here that's never talked about. There were black people living in the swamps not too far from here, the Great Dismal Swamp um, down in Florida, down in South Carolina, down in Louisiana, who were fighting the colonial powers, fighting the, the white supremacists and winning. When they had the Civil War, they would actually recruit black people from the swamps to fight in the Civil War. That's not talked about. The Seminole War that happened in Florida, that was a slave rebellion. It's framed as an Indian war, but that was deliberate because they don't want to let people know that it was black people freeing themselves. They make it seem like it was just the Red Indians, which is not true. Um, that movie is coming out in possibly December. I want to talk about that. Yes, indeed. I, 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 definitely, I definitely want to talk about it. But if you would also share you know, your thoughts, I, I characterize Haiti as sort of the microcosm man. Mm -hmm. It is the example of the abuse of colonial powers. Um, I gotta tell you, uh, as of recent, once the Queen of England died and you saw all of the laudatory behavior of people from around the world mm -hmm. and there being a lack of interest mm -hmm. in talking about some of the evil that has been done throughout the world by that crown, by that, by that throne. But one of the things, just in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, before we leave Haiti, the kind of pressure and oppression that France was able to extract mm -hmm. afterwards from a financial point of view mm -hmm. is something that has absolutely robbed the cough coffers of that country. You know, we keep getting the lens, looking through the lens and said, oh, you know, these Haitian people, they just can't get it together. Mm -hmm. There is just such incredible poverty there. What is wrong with those people? Mm -hmm. You care to share with the audience today a, a little bit about those economic sanctions, which were absolutely debilitating? Absolutely. Well, 
after the revolution, there was some infighting on the island. They had some black people there who were of mixed race, who had an affinity for the French. So they undermined a lot of what the black leaders were doing over there, and that allowed France to come in and put sanctions on them. They had to pay a form of reparations for their freedom to France, and France threatened them saying, look, if you don't give us this money, we will um, create another war. We know that you don't have the, the economic strength to fight us again. And plus, they were getting support. Europe, France was getting support from other European powers. The United States put sanctions on Haiti as well. So everybody was attacking Haiti economically because they couldn't really dominate them physically at the time. So we see the same thing that happens in um, certain black cities. When we see white flight, um, resources are drained from black areas, and then they say, well, look at these black people. They can't manage their exactly own cities. exactly why I was hoping you would go. It's exactly why I brought it up as a microcosm, mm -hmm. because I want our audience here in this building mm -hmm. and also that is watching, that might be watching this YouTube, wherever else we may expose it, mm -hmm. to understand that that microcosm, mm -hmm. that treatment of Haiti, is a treatment that much of our communities, many of our communities are experiencing to this day, right now. Absolutely. And what they try to do, they try to bring up other minority groups and allow them to have an economic base and say, well, look at these guys. They came over here. They're doing so much better than you black people. Why don't you act like them? These other groups are not being sabotaged like we are. These other groups don't have fines and sanctions put on them like we do. You look at black businesses all around the country, there's always some type of sabotage from the dominant society when it comes to black businesses all over the country. So we don't get the same targeting as other people and other people are not targeted like us. So that's why a lot of groups are allowed to succeed. Um, okay, let's, 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 let's move on. And, and there are a lot of subjects I wanna cover with yes, you indeed. today. Um, There has been quite the debate with the upcoming midterms mm -hmm. about whether or not black folks should participate in the electoral process, whether or not black folks should vote. Now, if I keep it, let me just for the, for the start of this, just keep it there and keep it simple. Your reaction to that is what? My reaction is if we don't get tangibles as black people, we should withhold our vote. A lot of people will say, well, our ancestors fought for the right to vote. No, they fought for tangibles and voting was a, a vehicle to get those tangibles. We don't vote just for the sake of voting. We don't just spin our wheels. We're supposed to get something for our vote. For the last 60 years, we've been voting. I'm talking about black people as a block. We've been the base of the Democratic Party. We've been voting to help other groups elevate themselves over us. And we sit around hoping that one day it's going to be reciprocal, and it has not been. So right now, at this juncture, we're finally saying we have to get tangibles specifically as black people. Because when we ask for tangibles, they run this trick bag on us and say, we'll give tangibles to minorities. Yeah, we'll give tangibles to you people of color. And then what happens is all of these other non-black groups start getting tangibles and they're just as hostile towards black people as the dominant white society. So we're delineating ourselves at this point saying that we, as black people, and even specifically as foundational black Americans, we have to get tangibles right now. So, you know, there are a lot of well-educated um, people who probably who would profess and, and many who have demonstrated a care for black folks that would come in here and try to take your head off right now mm -hmm. for the suggestion that we shouldn't go to the polls and vote. Mm -hmm. One of the things being that this is this is a dangerous time mm -hmm. and that there has been a there has been an effort underfoot to roll back gains that black folks have gotten as a result of the ballot box. And you respond? Well, the thing is, that's what I call the boogeyman strategy. A lot of what left-wingers would do, they will tell us we have to vote because the right-wing white supremacists are going to get us. 
They did that with the Trump thing. Well, if you let Trump get in office, the, the sky is going to fall. The sky didn't fall when Trump was in office, and I'm not a fan of Trump. I live in Los Angeles. Right now, you have a big scandal out there with Democratic Latinos who are so anti-black, it has the city torn apart right now. And a lot of the left-wing top brass, they're not speaking on this. We're dealing with this in Los Angeles. I don't want to replace right-wing white supremacy with left-wing white supremacy. I don't want any white supremacy. And I'm willing to hold my vote until we get something that's going to benefit black people tangibly first. So, so then let's, um, let's reduce that yes. some. As, as the midterms are arriving, a withholding of a vote mm -hmm. could indeed be the instrument that allows those who have openly professed, and I'm, I'm talking people like Ron DeSantis, um, 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 uh, the guy in, uh, the guy in, in, in Georgia, uh, Kemp, mm -hmm. Kemp, and Abbott in, uh, in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, those people who I think you clearly can identify as being anti-black, mm -hmm. that the withholding of the vote could allow them and their policies that are clearly designed for white supremacy and anti-black advancement mm -hmm. to win now. And it's like, and now is, now is the time. So the, the, those that might say to you that the withholding of the vote elects those who we know have no regard for our self-interest. You respond to that? If we vote for the Democrats, we're going to be actively participating in <clears throat> anti-black propaganda and anti-black policies. The Democrats are doing things that are directly targeting us in a negative way right now. Right now, they're telling us that abortion is the way. That's something that we shouldn't really be co-signing, um, killing our babies. And I'm pro-choice, but when they run to us with these Margaret Sanger type of ideologies, that's very dangerous. The Democrats are promoting... Can I stop you? Let, let, let go me, ahead, go let, ahead, go let ahead. Me, let me stop you there because, you know, somebody out there might say, hey, bro, that's a conflict. Mm. Um, you're pro-choice, but... Republicans are definitely saying no abortion with any exception whatsoever. And how do you reconcile it? Well, with them, they're trying to preserve their numbers. The white numbers are dwindling, so mm -hmm. they need to preserve their numbers by any means necessary. So mm -hmm. they are extreme to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. I think in certain situations, you should have abortion. In certain situations, um, the Democrats are just telling us, hey, if you want to save money, get an abortion. That's the stuff that they're promoting to us now. They're trying to make it seem like it's a hell, just a general health issue. It's like getting a cold and you go ahead and knock the cold out. I'm not that liberal with abortion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stuff that they're pushing, they're pushing sexual degeneracy, degeneracy towards us. They're, they're promoting stuff where little boys can wear dresses and little girls can, you know, it, it's a lot of weird stuff that they're promoting. Oh, let me let them work there. Mm -hmm. Just the car. I just, okay, the, the fire engine, I wanted to go there. But yeah, they're promoting a lot of stuff, a lot of sexual confusion to our children. Um, there's a lot of policies that they're promoting. They're promoting these other groups who are non-citizens to get tangibles over us. We have homeless black people all over the country. And our Democratic elected officials won't do anything to help these people, but they're using our tax dollars to give to Ukrainians and non-citizens. I'm not co-signing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, so, so you have, you're withholding your vote now. Mm-hmm. And what is it that, it doesn't matter the political persuasion, what is it that you would look for to release that vote and cast for someone uh, 
in an, in the electoral process. They are electoral going to have process. to give us the same type of tangibles that they give these other groups. When it comes to us getting tangibles, black people, particularly foundational black Americans, all of a sudden they give us all of these weird instructions and obstacles that we have to overcome in order for us to get tangibles. When we say we as black people want financial stability, we need a Marshall Plan to bail us out of the situation that we've been placed in. We're told, well, you gotta write a letter, you gotta meet with Congress, you gotta meet with the Congressional Black Caucus, you gotta go on a date with Joe Biden, you gotta go skating with Kamala Harris. They tell us we gotta do all of this stuff. Immigrant groups aren't doing this. These people don't even have the right to vote and they're getting all types of tangibles. The Native Americans don't have to do all this. They get all types of tangibles. All Ukrainians ain't even over here and they're getting billions of dollars sent over there to them. So none of these groups have to jump through hurdles except us. So I want us to get the same thing these other groups get. And when we say we want tangibles, they try to compare us to other groups. They'll say, and I've seen a lot of the Democratic elected officials say, yeah, we need to give reparations to black people and Native Americans. You see, so that's another trick bag. When you include other groups with what we need, you end up prioritizing them first and then leaving us with the bag open. Native Americans already get a form of rep rep reparations and they get tangibles. They get all types of money, free education, free housing, um, casinos. We want some of the stuff the Native Americans are getting because we deserve that because we built the country from scratch. Tariq, um, in looking at uh, some of your broadcasts, mm -hmm. I have noticed that you have a fairly uh, high-profile um, dispute with Roland Martin. <laughs> um, that you, 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 you to, to put it mildly, you, you've not treated him with kid gloves. Right, right. Now, right. now, now. He, he is someone that I understand that is right now uh, stomping in Georgia for Stacey Abrams mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Reverend Warnock in their races against Kemp and Herschel Walker. Mm -hmm. um, can you unpack that a little bit about why you go hard in the paint against a Roland Martin who, who many see as a bright, brother who um, <laughs> who is speaking a language that many that makes him popular in the black community yeah. Roland okay look look Roland is not that popular with a lot of younger black people they, they kind of look at Roland as a joke and this is why Roland always tries to come at us because he understands that we have the ear of the young people because we're not lying to them. And when you say come at us, meaning? Us, me and other people in the new black media and on the grassroots media, mm -hmm. you see? Because mm -hmm. we're not beholden to the Democratic Party. I don't want a job with the Democrats. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, I'm, I'm working for the people. Roland, and people, look, young people are not dumb. People see what Roland is trying to do. Roland is out here tap dancing for a job. Yes. Literally, when he got up there dancing with Hillary Clinton, that looked like a plantation flunky. And most people in the black community looked at that and saw for what it was. So Roland started coming at me first, by the way. That's why I went in on him. Mm. But Roland, he, he's... His job is to go out here for the Democrats and lie to the public and lie to black people to try to con us into voting for nothing. When you lie to people, you lose trust altogether. Nobody's going to rock with you. Roland has been going around talking about the Asian hate crime bill because we're pointing out the Democrats are giving hate crime bills and tangibles to other people but us. When we say, Roland, we need tangibles, Roland start stuttering and babbling. We, we, we can't. We can't do all that for black people. We can't. You can do it for Asians. And when we point that out, he says there ain't no ha Asian hate crime bill. That COVID bill ain't for Asians. But when you read it, every other word is Asian American, Asian American, Asian American. It's very specific for Asian people. So don't lie to us. I don't respect anybody who lies to the, the, the black voter base because we're trying to get tangibles and you're trying to get a job. That's, that's, that, that shows a lack of integrity. Yes, sir. So, you know, it, it, this made me think about something because... Um, I wrote, I've had Roland on my show. I've been on his show right. and, you know, I've seen him do what he does for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And as an elder, mm -hmm. somewhat, mm -hmm. not too much, 
<laughs> As an elder, I observe something, and that is that he is, I find Roland to be um, a fairly educated guy and who has some knowledge about the political landscape. So I don't, I personally don't look at him as a buffoon. I think you do. I do. Yes, okay. I do. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay. So, 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 mm -hmm. so, so you do. And it, it makes me think about, you know, and I keep, I'll use that word again as an elder. Mm -hmm. It makes me think about W.E. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Yeah. I look at Tariq Nasheed as being an extraordinarily bright, and talented brother. Mm -hmm. And from where I sit, what my, where my spirit is, is what if those two brothers could bury the hatchet? I say bury the hatchet because I specifically asked him whether or not he had a reaction to you. And it was a, he had quite a visceral, distasteful reaction to you. Mm -hmm. That may last forever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I do have the question as someone who loves black folks, who would desire to be a bridge builder in every circumstances where it is possible. Is that something you would ever consider? Not with Roland. Okay. Not with Roland because Roland, his biggest concern is Roland Martin. He'll throw everybody in this room and every other black person under the bus if he, he can get a job with the Democrats. Yes, sir. That's his biggest concern. It's all about Roland. And also, we have to understand, because Roland is not a full foundational black American, he doesn't have a camaraderie with the foundational black American community as I do. You understand? So okay, go let, let's let's start let's, like let's, let's start like with baby steps. Yes indeed. Define foundational black America. Black person who comes from a non immigrant background, somebody who comes from slaves in America, you're foundational. You come from the people who built the country from scratch. You don't have any immigrants in your family. Mm -hmm. And your approach mm -hmm. is to to be narrow mm -hmm. with that group of people um be narrow how let, let me let's unpack I, I, that. When, I, when i say be narrow, that that this to define, we're defining right it's an ethnic yeah. group it, yeah. just like a haitian person is a person who descended from haiti that's mm -hmm. a that's a distinct ethnic group right, right. we are a distinct ethnic group mm -hmm. we're, we're called african-american but that's a misnomer anybody can be african-american mm -hmm. elon musk is an african-american mm -hmm. we're being specific to our lineage we are foundational black americans we didn't immigrate i'm we gonna come put that on i'm gonna put that on twitter yeah elon yeah. musk is an african-american yeah, yeah yeah he's actually said it y'all see that he, he said that he yeah right, right yeah right. so white right. people Charlize Charlize theron is an african-american so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um we are a very specific group mm -hmm. we're the only group who come from a non-immigrant background who built the country Country from scratch. No other group can claim that. Absolutely. Okay. Now, Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. back then, mm -hmm. Stokely Qua Carmichael, mm -hmm. Kwame uh, Ture, Trinidad and brother, mm -hmm. who, of course, I didn't know Marcus Garvey, but I got to know Kwame. Mm -hmm. um, I was beyond thrilled that I think it's page 757 or 759 in his book, Ready for the Revolution. Mm -hmm. He talked about me. I didn't even know it. I didn't even know until a friend of mine was, man, why didn't you tell me I was in this book? So I got to know Kwame a little bit. Mm -hmm. To his dying breath, he would answer the phone saying, ready for, ready for the revolution. Mm -hmm. They, so the genesis and sort of it seemed their love and the thought how to best elevate black folks mm -hmm. was Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. As you define foundational black Americans, mm -hmm. 
it would seem that there would be a contradiction with that in Pan-Africanism. Is there? No. Okay. Because a lineage is a, is a lineage, no matter what your ideology is. Being a foundation of black American is not an ideology. It's a lineage. And we have a reparations movement happening right now. In order for us to get reparations, we have to define who's going to be qualified for the reparations. Right. So only one group, foundational black Americans, the people who descended from slaves, we're qualified for reparations. Mm -hmm. um, so, they, so, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, let me jump in. That has made you sort of the antichrist to some other black folks. Uh, people who don't want to see us get our tangibles. Yeah, mm -hmm. those and are I, the only people who would have a problem with that. And I, I, I'm talking about like, and uh, throughout the diaspora, mm. uh, uh, are you, I'm, I'm hearing mm -hmm. that you actually have gotten threats from other blacks mm -hmm. who claim that you are being wholly exclusionary. Is that true or not? Well, if we're getting reparations, we have to be exclusionary because everybody's not qualified to get reparations. We can't allow other groups to come in and get what we've gotten. That's affirmative action all over again. Affirmative action was supposed to be for us. They changed the word black to minority. Then everybody and their mama started getting affirmative action and we don't get anything. So we have to be exclusionary because when other groups come over here and they get resources, they exclude the hell out of us. They don't give us anything and don't bring us any tangibles. So we're tired of being the, the whipping boys and the lap dogs for all of these other groups and it's not reciprocal. So that's not to diss them. When it comes to getting things, knock yourself out. We're not trying to stop you from getting anything. But politically, we need something for the people in our lineage. It's time because we're suffering too much. Mm -hmm. And so you are, because I just, I just want to be clear, and, yes. I, and I want the audience to be clear. Mm -hmm. So you are throwing that Pan-Africanist idea you're not throwing, you are putting that aside and saying that your focus is on those descendants of people who were enslaved. You're isolating that group and saying your fight is for that group. That's where, that's where you are. When we're coming to tangibles right now, mm -hmm. it has to be for foundational black Americans. And I want justice for people worldwide. But here's the thing about Pan-Africanism, Brother Rock. Pan-Africanism, if we're going to be honest, as a whole, it has always been one-sided. We have been the ones pushing the Pan-African line as a collective. Yes, you might get a Garvey. Yes, you might get a Stokely Carmichael. These are outliers from those communities. The Trinidadians weren't pushing for Pan-Africanism. The Jamaicans and the Caribbeans were not supporting Marcus Garvey at first. Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanism vision failed in the Caribbean multiple times. He only got a leg up when he came here among us. We were the ones saying, yes, you are our brother, Pan-Africanism, we wanna ride for all black people. Yes, we love you, Garvey. We've been the only ones doing that. Even now, in some of these Caribbean and African nations, they're so tribal over there, they can't really get it together with each other there. So when they come here, they look at us as another hostile tribal group for the most part. Now, I'm not saying there's not one or two brothers and sisters who are riders. There are. But for the most part, for the collective, there is not any type of worldwide Pan-Africanism that's inclusionary of us. Other groups are very, very tribal. I am um, looking forward to doing a show. It'll probably be a, a two or three part series mm -hmm. on the life, times, and legacy of Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Elijah Muhammad, you know, it's, it's interesting. <clears throat> I, I came to this thinking uh, just a few years ago. It, it, it hit me of what he accomplished yeah. yes, sir. Mm -hmm. without the cell phone, Without a computer. <laughs> I've always told people Elijah Muhammad was, is possibly one of the greatest American leaders we've ever had. Nobody's done what he's done. And it's very low key. I've been talking about, I've been wanting to do a documentary about him for the longest because people just don't know how thorough he was. Yes. That brother had all types of farmland, all yes. types of successful yes, businesses, yes. Yes. created a military within yes. the nation of Islam, yes, which is the fruit of Islam, who yeah. I use with all of my events. Yeah. So 
we we really don't talk enough about. And our you brother. know about those uh, about those t tangible physical attributes mm -hmm. you're talking about mm -hmm. in terms of the businesses and how he grew in. You know, I guess he picked up a landline, you know, mm -hmm. and called Peru. And some kind of way made a deal where he got fresh fish mm -hmm. to bring into the communities and all the rest and Japan mm -hmm. and all over the world. Just how incredible that was. The other thing that Elijah Muhammad's leadership, his style, whatever his magic was, mm -hmm. it was picking up broken, beat down, dirty, stinking That's folks stupid. from the street yes, mm -hmm. and cleaning them up. Mm -hmm where their backs became straight, mm -hmm. their eyes became clear, mm -hmm. their skin was, was, was glowing mm -hmm. all over the country, mm -hmm. all over this country, and then, it, and then he exported it. Mm -hmm. So it was something really magical about this guy. Man, I, you know, I, I'd love to see what documentary you're going to do. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to do a show because I think it's important for somebody who had that kind of impact, mm -hmm. Who has very intentionally been minimalized yes. and scandalized? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It happens to black people all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think you run the risk of that kind of attempted minimalization and scandalization because of what you're doing? Because mm -hmm. He took that approach. These are my people mm -hmm. that I am lifting and I don't have any apology for it. Right, right. You seem to be doing the same. Mm -hmm. So how does that how does that work? How does that make you feel? When, whenever we do things independent of the dominant society to help our people, we're always going to be demonized. We, you're talking about but black folks. Black people in general. Mm -hmm. Anytime we do something to help our people and we look out for our folks, we're always going to be demonized. So we have to expect that walking in and we have to play past that and we have to have the community not fall into it. There's a movie or, or a television show called The Godfather of Harlem. Yeah. Very good show. Y'all see that show? Perfect show. Y'all know why that show is so good? A lot of shows are good when they have authentic people around. One of the, um, the advisors on that show is Professor James Small. Yeah. Yeah. So James Small grew up in Harlem and he grew up around Malcolm's family. He grew up around Elijah Muhammad and all those people. So they have him as a technical advisor. And with our brother James Small, he don't let them go too far crazy with the script. Mm -hmm. If they start talking about Elijah Muhammad and those women and all that, he let no, let's reel that back a little mm -hmm. bit. We're not going to go there. We're going to mm -hmm. focus on something else. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to have our people check other folks when it comes to them demonizing yes, our heroes. Yes, mm -hmm. Teach mm -hmm. Boy. I told you, there are a whole lot of stuff we want to cover. Yes, indeed. But yes, having indeed. made the comments you made about James Small yeah. and the Godfather of Harlem, Harlem, you know, you get into sort of some TV and movie, that sort of thing. Yeah. Talk to me about Kanye West. Mm, mm. Well, man. <laughs> Kanye, I got a lot of views on Kanye. I think Kanye is kind of a contrarian. And with Kanye, I think he wanted to get in those big money circles, but because he's black, they don't allow him in it because it's not about money with them. It's all about race. They don't care how much money you have. Michael Jackson learned that, you know? So Kanye has these billions of dollars, but he can't get in those circles like he wants to get in. So he's trying to use shaming tactics against people in order to allow him into those circles. So. When you start talking about all of these different groups, if the intent is not correct, I can't really co-sign it. He's not talking about these groups to benefit black people because Kanye will turn around and wear an all White Lives Matter shirt and say that slavery was a choice and then make disparaging comments about George Floyd. That's not cool. You're not looking out for black people saying that. You're pandering to the white supremacist crowd. And the reason why he's running around with Candace Owens and talking about her documentaries, because Candace Owens, her husband owns a website called Parlor. Mm -hmm. That's a website that mm -hmm. these white supremacists use to have that insurrection out here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they use to organize that on. Jesus. And Kanye is about to buy that thing. He's about to buy that site. So I don't know what Kanye is up to, but he's really pandering to that white supremacist crowd. So, so, so then should, should black folks then cancel Kanye? Well, the thing is, 
he's supported by some of the white supremacist groups or whatever, but do we have the power to cancel him? You understand? Because he's selling his shoes nation, um, internationally, so he's already doing his thing. He already has his money. So can we cancel him? Do we have the power to cancel him? Sure. Well, I, I wanted to get your, 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 your thought on that in terms of sort of really the, the, the spirit, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, that, that I had, I, I mentioned someone earlier, you know, that was close to this show who said that the day has to come when black people who who go against the interests of black people, other, the majority of black folks, mm -hmm. must pay a penalty. Mm -hmm. Do you think Kanye should pay a penalty? Mm -hmm. But we have to have the power to penalize him. Mm -hmm. So we don't mm -hmm. have a, a power structure to penalize Kanye. Mm -hmm. He deals with white people. That's why he can say slick stuff to us. See, a lot of people, when they get in certain positions, usually entertainers and athletes, they get their money from white society. So they love to take little shots at us. But what happens is they need us when white society turns on them. Then they want to come to us talking about, hey, big head, can you help me? So we have to say, look, if you put it on out there that you are going to be against us, don't come out here trying to pander to us when things go bad for you. Boy, that makes me think about O.J. Simpson. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it makes, it, it just, it, 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 I see a picture mm -hmm. of a man who um, appeared for a good period of time to want to run away from blackness as best he could. Mm -hmm. But then when he got his ass scorched, mm -hmm. he ran back to blackness. Yes, he did. And did a da even did a damn two-hour interview with me on the radio. Mm -hmm. Oh, he was running all that over L.A. That would have yeah. never happened prior to yeah. the ass burning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he had to get the legendary Johnny Cochran to save him. Yeah. You know, and Johnny Cochran, yeah. he's always remained black. That's why Johnny Cochran is revered in black society today. So he, he needed, um, and, and, um, he also had some of the FOIs. Remember? Y'all remember the case, the OJ case? He was going in there with the FOIs. The white supremacists yes, were having a yes, fit sir. when they saw that. They yes, thought sir. the world was over. <laughs> <laughs> it like they did, like, like they did when they saw the FOI with Michael Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, what, yeah. What, 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 what people don't know is that Michael Jackson and, and, the, and, and Minister Farrakhan communicated on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael was a rider. Michael was yeah. a rider. A lot of folks don't know that. That's yeah. why they, they turned on Michael. See, they yeah. thought Michael was just going to be, you know, just a soft-spoken, um, tap-dancing artist, and Michael was going behind their backs, mm -hmm. buying all of that publishing. So they weren't expecting that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in Washington, D.C. right now. Mm -hmm. You're going to have an event two weeks from now. Yeah. Two weeks from now, on November the 5th, you're going to have the Foundational Black Americans Rally for Reparations. Yes, indeed. Lord, I want to get to that. Yes. Before I do, you mentioned a term earlier called the New Black Media. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that term. When you mentioned that term, again, I saw visions of a media that would make, quote unquote, mainstream media and other more traditional black media more nervous than coffee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Who is the new black media? Um, it's a lot of us on the grassroots. It's me, brothers like um, Jason Black, the Black Authority, Professor Black Truth, Brother Philip Scott down there in Texas. So it's uh, um, Sister Vicki Dillard. A lot of us online who are not connected to a corporate structure, who's telling the truth and people look to us and they trust our vision and they trust our expertise into getting the information out. The people like Roland and other folks, we know where the information is coming from. We know that there's a slant to it. We know that they're being manipulated by the powers that be. So we know that the information is not going to be accurate. The, the general public is not dumb. People know when they're getting real accurate information. So that's what we do. We bring accurate information without any puppeteering. You haven't mentioned Al Sharpton's name. Mm, mm. 
Should I have to? <laughs> I would like you to respond. Okay. I mean, people know what Al Sharpton's get down is. <laughs> that that kind of goes without saying. He, he's he's you know he's clicked in with the Democrats. He's going to do what they tell him to do. If you're on M MSNBC, that's the Democrat National Network. So any anybody on MSNBC doing a show and. Almost every week, somebody on MSNBC is taking a shot at me. They always take shots at me on MSNBC because that's the Democratic mouthpiece. So the information coming from them, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. Now, are you cool with Sharpton? You cool with Sharpton? I don't have any real dealings with him. Okay. Um, I've, I've known him mm -hmm. um, since you asked me that question. Yeah. I mean, I think I've seen some good work that he's done. Mm -hmm. um, I also saw some things that I found distasteful. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But 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 I bring his name up because when you talk about this new black media, yeah, the those who would be in a position like a Reverend Sharpton. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine that people get in certain positions where they're where they're where they're making money, yeah, and they have personal comfort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this new black media that you're talking about doesn't at all seem to be beholden to, as you say, the corporate interest. Mm -hmm. Therefore, is able to tell a more undiluted truth. Mm -hmm. It reminds me when I was negotiating a deal, and it was a fairly large deal with HBO. Mm -hmm. I was going through a period when I wore primarily African garb. Mm -hmm. My head, my kufis on, <laughs> you know, my dashikis and, you know, um, all of that. Mm -hmm. And I was doing business with them because I represented Riddick Bow, who was of value to them. No one was doing me a favor. Mm -hmm. But one day, I went into a meeting in a three-piece suit. And one of the most senior executives in the Time Warner Sports Department said to me, Eugene, it looks like you really came to do business today. Mm, 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 mm. Mm, mm, mm. And it was one of the times, because I tried to conduct myself, you know, with professional decorum. Mm. But it was one of the times where my knee-jerk reaction was to say, motherfucker, you're about to make me act like a nigga now. <laughs> And um, we had some conversation about that. And, you know, we, were, we, 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 worked, through, we worked through it, yeah. not so much because of my brilliance, but it was we were fulfilling a need that they had. So yeah. we, we got the money. <laughs> we, 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 we got the money. Um, so this, this issue, this issue of people and punditry, and folks who indeed now look i don't would you wouldn't advise hey don't take that job at cnn don't take that job at M, in, at msnbc or would you advise yeah if, look if you need a job people need to work people mm -hmm. need to work i would say don't go to the job and then be a flunky for the people at the job don't undermine black society just so that you can get a paycheck you can have integrity with whatever you do you understand? So that's my biggest concern. This is why black people, you always need to have some type of relationship with the black masses. We do have a lot of black people who are into these circles, who really have a secret disdain for black society. Let me go deep for a minute. Please. Roland Sharpton, these are boule guys. Teach. I'm gonna have to go there for a minute. The boule class for a long time, and not all, because I know some people in the boule who are very cool. But in black society, most black society don't know about the boule class. And for years, the boule class has been somewhat elevated to a certain degree as a buffer group. 
and they get into these little combined circles among each other. And then it turns into this, well, we're better than the other Negro masses. We're the talented 10th. So it's up to us to lead these wayward Negroes. So they have that mentality and they're so out of touch with the real black masses because the black masses, we're not dumb. The, the brother out there on the street, the hustler, that's not a dumb dude. He might not have had certain opportunities, but that's not a dumb dude. That's not a dumb girl. They look at them as being less than and that they've been assigned by white people to be their leaders. That breeds more contempt from the black masses where the black masses can't trust them and they shouldn't because they're not trustworthy. I was, <laughs> let me talk about this. Yes. I was at a party, invited to a party mm -hmm. in Las Vegas. I'm going to withhold the name because I don't want to unnecessarily humiliate or embarrass mm -hmm. the couples whose home hosted the party. Okay. So I went to the, I went to the, I was at this party and somewhere there, the, uh, the husband asked me, was I on my way to the boule? Mm. And I didn't know what it was. Mm. <laughs> I, I didn't even know what the boule was at that time. Mm. And I had a friend who I was able to whisper to. She was from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I said, what is, do you know what the boule is? Mm. Boule is? And she said, yeah, that's some bougie Negroes and this and that. She said, you know, I mean, you got all the characteristics in terms of, you know, you're fairly successful. You, you, you know, you're sure enough, light skin enough and your mm -hmm. hair. And I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you would fit except you got some jacked up politics. And <laughs> when, it, when it comes to them, you're, I don't think your politics or your outspokenness and this koofy that you'd be wearing would really qualify you. Mm -hmm. So that's how I became aware and why I'm not, you know, like, huh, what's the boule? Right, right, that's right, right. how that's how I found out about the boule. And for a long time. Uh, let me, let me go, finish, go, go, let ahead, go, go ahead, go ahead. 20 minutes later, it occurred to me that everybody in this house, and now we got about 80 people in the house, was real light skin. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was like, this ain't unintentional. This ain't unintentional. And I rolled on. I, I was courteous. Mm -hmm. I didn't cause a scene, mm -hmm. but I rolled on out. That's a whole nother show. Yes, it, indeed. It, that, that, yes, we, indeed. We, you know, you're going to come yeah, back yeah. to see me. Or I'm going to come yeah. to see you or something. But that's a whole nother show uh, in terms of colorism. Yeah. They were real Rule. big on that. Lord. Yeah. There was no way that that was. Unintentional. They were the, the boule crowd. They were infamous for having the brown paper bag test for a yeah. long time. You, yeah. you couldn't be darker than a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a brown she paper knew bag. about that. Yeah. Sister, sister from New Orleans knew about that. Yeah, knew about yeah. that. So, yeah. So that mindset was the 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 foundation of this organization. So when they started letting the darker ones in, like Roland, you see, <laughs> he's acting light skinned <laughs> yeah. yeah. And listen how they talk to the black masses. Roland, whenever Roland is talking to us, you stupid fools, it's always an insult towards the black masses. You dummy, you fools, y'all don't know what you're doing, you stupid, stupid, stupid. That whole denigrating mindset to the black masses as if we don't know um, what's best for us politically. That's that boule mentality that a lot of people are turned off by. You know? Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question, put you on the spot. Yes, indeed. In the event, mm -hmm that he would agree to sit at this end of the table. Mm -hmm. Would you agree to sit at that end of the table and then a discussion take place? Should I do that? Oh God. I, you know, I would do it, I, you know, I would do it for the entertainment value. I think it would be in, just the entertainment value. Yeah. The, the entertainment value would be interesting, but um, I don't, to be honest, I, I don't see anything constructive out of, of talking with Roland, you know? And, and truth be told, it would almost be me giving Roland clout, you know? And I can guarantee you, I, I, I can guarantee you, he feels the same way, that it would be, you know, 
Mm-hmm. Giving, giving you clout. Well, he he don't have clout to give. No. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but I digress. All right. So we talked about November the 5th, Foundational Black Americans Rally for yeah. Reparations. Yes, indeed. Tell me all about that. Yeah. We, we have to talk about what's specific for us. Um, anytime they have rallies around the country about justice for black people, for some reason, it always gets um, misdirected into something else. Whenever there's a rally, all of a sudden they say, well, Black Lives Matter. Well, guess what? Trans Black Lives Matter, too. All of a sudden it gets dissipated into something else. We start talking about what we need to get. Then they start talking about, well, immigrants need something, too. So we want to have a rally where we're specifically focused on foundational black Americans getting what we're supposed to get. This is going to be the first time in history that we've only focused on our political needs. And there's nothing wrong with that. Our people need help out here. We have so many homeless black people all over the country, black people who are jobless, um, black people who are getting funneled in and out of the prison system. So we need to, to remedy that specifically. I had Armstrong Williams. Mm-hmm. The black conservative mm-hmm. on my short on point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Armstrong screamed. He said, I don't want no reparations. Um, what a repar- what, To you who is leading this, and we have in the house your co host, Jade. Jade, Miss Jade, the yes, lovely she, Jade. She, in here. She, yes. she, yes. Is, she is here, and she, I found her to be mm-hmm. such the activist. Yes, she is. DC is blessed to have her. Uh, amongst all of us. Um, What does reparation look like? Um, It looks like cash payments to foundational black Americans. (laughs) See, the same thing that Native Americans get, we should be getting the same thing too. See, what happens is they try to redefine reparations when it comes to us. They start saying, well, reparations, that's free HBCU tuition. No, that's not reparations. No, reparations is cash. We want the same thing that was taken from us. When our people were enslaved, they were making money off of our people. We want the same money back. We want the same land back. We want the same protections that we're supposed to be getting. The 14th Amendment and all of these other civil rights bills were supposed to be for us. Now they're against us. Black people are getting charged with hate crimes against Asian people. If you argue with an Asian person and you're black, you'll go to jail and get charged with a federal hate crime. We don't even have those kind of protections. You have black women out here getting kidnapped by white supremacists out here in Kansas City. A white supremacist yes, kid was kidnapping black women. The black community was speaking up about it. The police was ignoring it. We have to have a a federal hate crime bill for black people to protect us specifically. So many of those things are what we're going to talk about at the November 5th rally. Who are you? Who's your target? The entire society. Everybody. It's not just the political structure. Everything is politics. Mm -hmm. You know, politics is not just voting. You're You're in the political process every day. Politics is an everyday thing. And as some of the revolutionary brothers said back in the day, politics is warfare without gunshed, or without bloodshed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and war is politics with bloodshed. So we have to look at politics as a, a section of war. It's a form of warfare because warfare is being waged against us. When they deprive us of resources, that's warfare. When we see so many homeless black people, that's by design. That's warfare. These things are just not happening. When we see our children being deprived of the proper education, that's a form of warfare. Abortion is a form of warfare. Margaret Sanger, when she created the whole Planned Parenthood thing, that was targeting black people specifically. She specifically said she wanted to wipe the black population out. You see, we have to understand everything in its right context. You mentioned uh, Professor Smalls. Yes, indeed. Earlier. Mm -hmm. I see on your uh, promotional information that Professor Smalls will be there. Who are some of the other people that, you know, have committed to participate? Yeah, we're going to have our good brother Reza Islam. He's going to be there. Um, A a DMV sister, Dr. Mayat, she's going to be there. Brother Kaba Kamene, who's a part of the Hidden Colors franchise, he's going to be there. Um, We have so many. we got a brother who's a candidate down in South Carolina, Brother Marcel Dixon, Mm -hmm. a real good brother. We're going to have him there. So we got a... a, a Boyce Watkins? Yes, our brother Boyce. We're going to talk about the financial um, sector of it. We're going to have good brother Boyce. So it's going to be a heavyweight program. Okay. So this is going to be at... On the mall. Yes, it's going to be at Freedom Plaza. Freedom Plaza. Yeah. uh, Washington, Mm D.C. This is the home of the... uh, 
House of Representatives. Yes, indeed. And uh, the Senate. Mm -hmm. Any of them participate? We are talking to some political people to have them come down. So we're in the process of working that out now, but they're going to see it because this is going to be a big event. So worldwide, this is going to be seen. We have the international press coming down, so they're going to see what we're doing. That is uh, Saturday, November the 5th mm -hmm. on the mall at, at, at Free Freedom Plaza. Start, start, starting there. Yeah. At, 11 a.m. Freedom Plaza. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you want to leave when you leave? Mm -hmm. What do you want to have accomplished? I want black people to understand that you can be fearless in what you do. The secret of life is living without fear. I want y'all to really understand that. When you don't have fear no more, you've cracked that code of really enjoying life to the fullest. A lot of stuff that we don't do is because of fear, fear of failing, fear of dying. When you get over the fear of dying, let's go back to the Haitian Revolution. The reason why they were so successful, they tapped into the voodoo. And in the voodoo spirit, you don't have a a fear of dying because you know you're going to transition to a better place. Once they lost their fear of dying, they were able to defeat all of those armies, mm -hmm. those military powers. So I was at a conference of Organization of African Union mm -hmm. in Tripoli. In Lib it was in CERT. It was in CERT. Yeah. And um, I had headphones on. Mm -hmm. And when it came for Gaddafi to speak, Gaddafi talked to 49 other African heads of states and, and delegates mm -hmm. about his desire that there would be a new currency throughout Africa secured by the natural resources in the ground, which is more plentiful in Africa than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And when the translator translated it, I had a sense of nervousness. Mm -hmm. I was like, they're going to kill him. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about doing something that revolutionary for the, for the, benef for the benefit of Africans, mm -hmm. As we know how uh, uh, history has been, that puts a, you become a target. Mm -hmm. Maybe not on that scale, but talking about doing what you're getting ready to do puts a target on you. Yes, indeed. And this is a time where they talk about white hate groups and, you know, vigilantes mm -hmm. and all the rest. Mm -hmm. How does that factor into what you're doing? Well, the thing is, because I've, I've heard the argument many times, when we do stuff like this, that makes you a bigger target. The problem is, even if you don't do anything, you're still a target. Black people are being targeted in their neighborhoods. Anything you do, you're a target. If you are going into a Walmart, you got black people going to Walmart getting gunned down by race soldiers. Almost everything we do makes us a target. So we might as well stand up for ourselves. We might as well say what needs to be done. We, we shouldn't fear that these people are going to attack us because if you have money, they will attack you. If you don't have money, they will attack you. So you might as well go out doing the right thing. We got, we got to wrap up. Yeah. What? Tell us about your next uh, film project. Yeah. The next film is American Maroon. It talks about many of the black maroon societies who fought against racism and, and white supremacy and they burned down plantations and they freed themselves which is a story that's never told. And the maroon spirit is something that not only happened in slavery, but it carried on to the civil rights movement. And even now we have somewhat of a maroon spirit. We also talk about in the movie, in the late 60s, early 70s, there were a lot of urban warfare revolutions around the country that's never talked about. You have a lot of groups like the Black Liberation Army and others who were attacking police stations, attacking judges, freeing black people from prison. These were the people who got Asada, Asada Shakur to Cuba, the Black Liberation Army. This was a common thing in the 70s that's never talked about. So we're going to talk about the maroon spirit 
from the, the early inception and how it relates to modern society. So it's a very interesting film. The struggle continues. Yes, it does. I'm glad you're part oh, of it. Oh, man. I appreciate you, you, brother. Thank you. Absolutely. No. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a, a news flash here. We had great exclusive here. Um, of course, I tweeted. Um, um, oh, you get the, thank you, get the brother yes, uh, from here, here on the Rock Gloomy Show. And Roland Martin has responded. Uh oh. Uh, Roland Martin says, I would never sit down with yes. a sexist, misogynistic, and black immigrant hating asshole <laughs> to read in the, in the sheet. His attack on, I don't know who this is, Joe Didi. Who? Um, I don't know who that is. Who is this? Yo, 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 um, uh, your Tindy, I forgot. I know who okay, she is. Yeah. She's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and my defense of her set him off to attack me. He regularly calls black women big wenches. Um, I'll talk to Rock anytime. Tariq can go to, go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm responding that it would be a great um, um, uh, debate to address the long-held divisions in the, in the, um, the black struggle. Um, memories of W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, Marcus Garvey comes to mind. Mm. Uh, so that's my response. So I didn't